this presentation will cover a couple of mainly forgotten 17th century Lutheran pedagogues from the era of Lutheran orthodoxy, although some people count both of these characters among proto-pietists, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, and my fart appears in our hymnal. Um, Jerusalem, du hochgebaute Stadt. I forget exactly the English title. Um, Dilher is not in our hymnal. He's been chiefly forgotten, although he was far more influential in his own day. So Johann Michael Dilher. During the Baroque era, Nuremberg functioned as the de facto cultural and financial capital of the Holy Roman Empire. Professor at the Auditorium Publicum Aegidianum, essentially a junior college established by Dilher himself, director of the Gymnasium Aegidianum, inspector of the school city schools, head pastor at St. Sebald, and director of the city library simultaneously. Dilher was the most influential theologian in this metropolis and central to its cultural bloom from 1642 until his death in 1669. After studying in Leipzig, Altdorf, and Jena, focusing especially on Aristotle's rhetoric, philology, and oriental languages. Dilher was chosen for the position of professor of eloquence at Jena, where he was drawn into the circle of academics around Johann Gerhardt, whose decisive influence upon Dilher permeates all of his later work. Um, when he was brought onto the faculty, there were two others uh, two other candidates for the position, um, and they were all spoken well of. However, the faculty, the philosophical faculty, which provided a gutachten, a suggestion, uh, in his favor said about him that he was a young man most versed, very versed, in languages and the philosophical disciplines, and as if born as if born for some academic profession. I included this quote because it shows that uh, although there never was a golden age, as Professor Korchuk told us, there was in fact an age that is um, almost unrecognizable to us in terms of academic competence. There certainly was a much, much greater level of academic competence than we have access to even among some of our most learned theologians, certainly in terms of competence in the languages. Um, one of his biographers wrote um, that he never withdrew faith, labor, industry in his professions, in his teachings, um, and that he was always filling uh, the literary republic with benefits of all good things. Um, and besides his four professorships, he held four professors, professorships simultaneously, he would offer private instruction, private colleges, usually three at minimum, he says, in oratory, speech, in letter writing, in Hebrew, Chaldean, Syriac, Greek, um, and in reading theology, and in public speech. Well, Actually, not sure what that word is. Um, but he was doing this all simultaneously. Uh, during his time in Jena, he was also asked to begin preaching. This was the inscription above his office door. Stand, guest. Don't knock. Don't disturb. Unless some greater force compels. I know that the afternoon hours are consecrated to my God and to the mandates of my office. If there is something which would merit some expenditure of precious time, yours, let yours be the afternoon. Nevertheless, that you know you will have to render an account of every single hour to God. 
So I'd like to put that above my door. Um, but it shows his understanding of the value of time. The days are evil. Um, well, we'll back up a little bit. Um, he was also tasked with giving a funeral oration for Gerhardt, um, in which he said that the house of Gerhardt was, um, was a museum of the entire Christian world, um, as if a temple of the Holy Spirit, where men of every rank and order be- could become erudite, were able to become erudite. Um, and you get this impression that there is this lively culture at the University of Vienna around the house of Gerhardt. There are people present in their homes uh, speaking and learning from his wisdom. Not only was Dilher a prolific lecturer, his writings are copious. While his early works, those composed at Jena, were mainly academic in nature, most of those composed in Nuremberg were written in the vernacular, German, and are devotional or ethical in nature. His postals, collections of sermons to the church here, uh, eminently practical and popular in conception, often adorned with verse and emblems and imbued with Luther's visual graphic rhetoric, captivate and edify, belying the oft-repeated misconception of Lutheran orthodoxy as dead, dry, remote, and inaccessible. Although these works provide an inexhaustible reservoir for research and uh, resourcement, and are of no small interest for the history of German literature, I will mention briefly those works of his which are particularly illuminating for Lutheran pedagogy and child-rearing. These three writings were all composed shortly before or after receiving a call to serve as director of the gymnasium in Nuremberg, and are programmatic, laying the foundation for Dilher's success in turning the school around. There are some other writings which pertain to his educational theory um, that are in German. I will not refer to those. I only had access to what I could get through Google Books, although it's amazing how much is on Google Books. Um, so the, the speech that he gave when he was spending some time in Nuremberg, he actually had received leave from his prince to go to Italy, and he never made it. So he just spent time in Nuremberg, and it may have been his plan all along <laughs> um, to spend time in Nuremberg um, because he was invited by essentially the Board of Regents of, of the gymnasium to give a speech. Um, and that's on the, the proper education of children, the, the first one mentioned here. But these quotes come from that and a speech he gave after accepting the position to found basically the junior college and to serve as rector of the gymnasium, and that's Icarus Academicus. Um, so he says, virtue, um, he begins with virtue, very classical, um, is a habitus, which is achieved with frequent actions, according to the philosophers. Um, And it is manifest that the first care, uh, the first care of the republic, uh, should be to imbue with zeal of virtue both those who command and those who obey. Um, Like every other Lutheran theologian of his age, he... Uh, he is a man who accepts hierarchy in the civil realm. He's not, he's by no means uh, a modern liberal. And you can, you can pick up on that with command and obey. Um, or what is the same thing, t- that they be educated with right information, right, with right formation, without which laws are inane. Horace says this. Uh, and all shouts of dissuasion or in vain. I mean, the second quote, he talks about um, 
only, only a crazy architect uh, who did not rightly locate the foundation. Uh, only, someone would be, only an architect who is crazy would promise that the building that he has built is firm um, after not having made a firm foundation. And likewise, um, should we promise, should we promise um, a flourishing church or a republic? So once again, there's this concern both for raising up leaders in the church and for raising up leaders in the civil realm. How can we promise a flourishing church or republic if uh, no one is rightly educated for this or that? that is for the church or for the civil realm. Um, so like Quintilian, uh, perhaps the most read pedagogical theorist of the Renaissance, um, Dilhair goes back to early childhood education, especially in this first speech. And he goes even further than Quintilian because he focuses on spouse selection. Education begins with spouse selection. Um, so because frequently the nature and the affect of the parents is transferred into the children, we must think about honest men and women who are well-moraled, as it were. Um, from whom may be conceived the hope of a generous offspring. And then he says, the Spartans were praised by Plutarch um, because they didn't hesitate to fine for money, fine with money, their king, Archidamus, their very king, because he did not blush to join himself in matrimony to a very small woman. Um, adding that there, there could be no hope of a robust, of a robust child progeny uh, from the same, from her, or from him, really, from their king. So the, the Plutarch praises the Spartans because they were upset with their king. They find him because he married a small woman from whom they could not expect a strong king. What these thought about the habit of the body, the same should be judged uh, about the quality of the mind derived into the offspring. Um, so consider well whom you marry in terms of their physical and their mental capability. He's concerned about how children are raised up from the very earliest age, uh, as was Quintilian. And he's very concerned that children learn proper speech patterns, proper pronunciation from the very earliest age. Um, Quintilian suggests, uh, well, having a wet nurse who is well-educated herself, um, we live in Alexandria, Virginia. There's a lot of very wealthy people who have two-income households, and they hand their children over to frequently to Spanish-speaking nannies, and I'll sometimes take my son to the uh, playground and listen to the children speak broken English with one another. Um, it's interesting that these parents who spend so much money, who who work so hard to acquire wealth to hand over to their children. And Dilher addresses this as well, that in his own age, parents are concerned mainly with the athletic training of their children and with acquiring wealth that they can hand over to them. And he says this is all for naught if they are not well-educated in virtue. I see the same thing in our own age. Two-parent households bringing in as much money as they can handing their children over to 
nannies who will train them in poor speech and whose care for them cannot be the same as the care of a, ma- of a mother. And in fact, he quotes um, a Fabius. I wasn't able to find this quote, actually. Um, I'm not sure where it comes from. But the, the quote is longer than this, and it's really about the decline of the Roman Empire. And Fabius is arguing that this correlates, right, the decline of morals in Rome correlates also to the fact that in, in earlier times, uh, children, the son of someone born from a chaste parent, was uh, not educated in the cell of a purchased wet nurse, but rather in the bosom of his mother. And that it was their principal praise to take care of the home and to serve their children. So by quoting this, Dilher is indicating that he thinks much the same about the morals of his own age. For him, uh, it is... It is chiefly the mother's duty to raise her child in infancy. Um, And he says, when we look at the wild animals, we do not see them handing over their children to be nursed by someone else. And if if this is the way of nature for animals, which are vile and low, how much more for us humans? Um, he has some rather uh, prescient notions about play and the role of play in early childhood education. He's very concerned that nothing, especially when children are learning to speak and when they're learning their first letters, that nothing is done with compulsion. Um, So the first things having been made or to be made uh, from speeching, then should be, we ought to trans, to go over then uh, to the knowledge of letters. So, uh, with prayers, by the way. We are to do this with prayers. And, uh, and to reading. However, not so that, that this would be uh, obligation or work, but play. So that it would appear to be not work but play, not necessity but will. And he says that letters can be written on top of a, um, a rod that it, the children ride, like a wooden horse, uh, or upon cubes. Um, and, you know, I've got these today, and my son has some. Um, so that the, the children can be interrogated almost as if through a joke, through jest. Um, and that when they pronounce a word, a letter correctly, that they are remunerated with a nut or a piece of fruit or a small little coin. And it's also, this is a different quote here. He said, we have to be careful, must beware, uh, lest the child hate studies. So this is a primary concern of his not to engender a bitterness perceived in infancy of these things that might pass over to uh, over the rude years, so into their later years. So a major concern of his that children not uh, be taught to hate learning at an early age. So what is, what is the curriculum? And he really goes into this especially in some of his later orations. Um, he says we ought to return to erudition, uh, which is recovered through, especially through the two languages, Latin and Greek. Um, he says, it is sweeter, just as, as it is sweeter, so also it is safer uh, for waters to be drunk directly from, or from the fount itself. Um, so he's concerned that we learn Latin and Greek because of the primacy of, of the received knowledge of the West, which is in these languages, it is both sweeter, it is more pleasant. So there is an aesthetic quality to learning these languages. Uh, there is a quality that delights 
and that is enjoyed, um, but is also safer. Because as we know, some things are always lost in translation. Um, and he says, if we were to assert, however, if we were to assert um, that someone could lack Latin who, who desires uh, to be numbered among the semi-pagans, uh, as Perseus called the semi-learned, calls the semi-learned, and I think this is on purpose, semi-pagan. Now, pagan really means rustic, um, but it was used by the Christians to describe non-Christians. Um, then we would wear our brain in our shoes, he says. This is actually a common idiom. Um, so it's absolutely absurd that we might think that without Latin, we're even half taught. So Latin and Greek form the core of the curriculum in his mind. Um, and he says, the, but he, nevertheless, he understands that they are tools. So they're the first step to obtaining everything else in his mind. And he goes through the trivium. This has the highest place for him. These are the things that are to be digested. So he makes a distinction between those things that we digest and those things that before university or the higher schools we begin to taste. The things that must be digested for him are Latin and Greek. And for him that means fluency in reading, it means fluency in writing, and it means fluency in speaking. Notice that he does these in a different or Every time he mentions the trivium, he always mentions them in this order, grammar, rhetoric, logic. Dilher is a child of late humanism, and he values rhetoric more than logic. Um, rhetoric is, for him, uh, the art of speaking ornately and orderly. This is eloquence. He doesn't mention persuasion, which I find interesting. For him, it is adorning your speech. Um, although he wants children to avoid dis disputation, which was a large part of the late medieval curriculum um, and was revived even within Luther's lifetime at Wittenberg. Um, so it's there present at the beginning of his, his work in Wittenberg. It's also revived at the end. Um, Dilher is, is a little worried about this. And this has to do with his Icarus theme. So the whole purpose of creating a junior college is that he's worried that all of these students leaving the gymnasium to the university are like Icarus. They're going to fly too high and they're going to melt their wings. Um, and one of the things that he mentions, he quotes uh, the humanist Reuchlin, who says that students in their first year at the university know everything. At their second year, they begin to doubt whether they know everything, and only in their third year at the university do they begin to learn anything. And he thinks this ought to be avoided. Um, so he's very concerned in his speech, and that's the theme of his speech, that, um, that most of the students being sent out of the gymnasium are, are ill-equipped because they, they actually can't understand Latin, uh, certainly not when it's being spoken. They cannot read it fluently. Um, and we'll get to that more. Um, he also thinks that not all of Aristotle's organon, not all of logic ought to be taught at the gymnasium, certainly not there, not even at this junior college. Some, he wants logic to be saved, even though he thinks it's important to think correctly, to be saved for the university, at least the analytics. Um, the things that he thinks ought to be tasted are Hebrew, music, and mathematics, although he does designate an entire speech to the importance of learning Hebrew. Language instruction. What he has to say about language instruction, I find very interesting. I don't have time to go into it, um, but there is a, there is a strong um, reform movement within the schools beginning at, at the beginning, beginning at the beginning of the 17th century that influenced a lot of the theologians at Jena. There was a guy who was uh, something of an unstable character named Ratke who 
made all these claims about being able to teach children without grammar instruction or without explicit grammar instruction, or use learning grammar after you've learned to read, there's a book that does this, at least chapter by chapter. Um, so he's, a, he's an early proponent of what we, we might call the natural method. Um, he, a lot of people support him, a number of theologians, uh, I want to say the, the entire faculty at Erfurt, um, come to his defense, try to work out his methodology. Um, he almost always gets into fights with them and then leaves. So he's, he's a failed person, and yet his ideas kind of live. They're picked up later by uh, Jan Amos Comenius, um, and they're also picked up by Dilher to some extent. Gerhardt also wrote in favor of, of Ratke's method, um, which I found very interesting. Dilher doesn't want to get rid of grammar. He's not that radical. Um, but the main, care of, the main concern of grammar for him uh, consists in reading that is perceived, reading that is understood as much as is possible. And because of that, and his writing is very beautiful, he was clearly trying to show off. Like most of the humanists, he's, he's flexing when he gives an oration, so it's very difficult. I mean, this Latin is, this is, Neo-Latin is usually quite a bit easier than classical Latin, but these orations by these humanists are often very difficult to read. Um, but he puts reading for first. So even, he puts the, the direct object here, right at the beginning, because he's trying to indicate his priorities. Reading is the main care of grammar. He suggests that this be done by using a grammar text that is incredibly short, reduced to on only the most important paradigms and rules, uh, and that children then be given a lexicon with which they can learn a core vocabulary very quickly, and that from there they proceed to reading. He also praises the gymnasium um, in Nuremberg for requiring spoken Latin in the classroom. Um, and he complains, he says, uh, most of us aren't actually competent in Latin until the far end of old age. So he's talking about himself, um, and he's complaining, how is this the case when we spend half a decade learning it in school? But any of these diplomats who've never had formal instruction go to France or they go to Spain, and within two years they're fluent in the language. And that's through use. Um, so he is very, very concerned that Latin be used in the classroom and that students be brought to reading as quickly as possible. I discovered a few days ago he was also responsible for a printing of a few of Comenius's books in Nuremberg. And Comenius's books give extensive universal vocabulary in context, with one of them with pictures, his Orbis Pictus. Uh, it is one of the first picture books um, for learning, perhaps the first in, uh, in the modern era. And he's also concerned with the conduct of the office of teaching and for the, with the sort of person who is given the position of teaching. Um, he says, you will learn more easily if you've loved your teacher. So for him, it's very important that the teacher love his students so that the students learn their love their teacher. Um, whose, whose words, whose things that he has said, you will never, you will never ha hate, you will never neglect. If you love your teacher, you will not neglect uh, or despise his teaching. And he's actually quoting uh, another Renaissance theorist um, of education from the 15th century, Vives. Um, let me go back to this. He also, he notes that it is very important that the teacher be discerning and that he not always use the same method for teaching every student. That he be able to discern different groups of students. He really, he mentions three groups of students. One, 
is a student who's probably best suited for working in the fields um, and should be encouraged to leave the academic course at an early age. The other two are those who, um, who are led and who need to be drawn, he says. So some can just be led by the weight of your personality. Some need to be cared for in different ways. And to be able to perceive the, the different gifts of your students and to alter your method accordingly is very important. He says if you don't have the ability to discern between the gifts of your students, you are not suited to be a teacher. Um, this is from the Icarus Academicus. You can see Icarus falling. He's concerned not just about the academic competence of the student, especially the student's ability in the languages, and that the student does not necessarily have a desire for disputation. Both Dilher and Myfart, I don't know what time it is, both Dilher and Myfart um, are very intentionally avoiding in their careers polemics. So that does distinguish them from people like Kaloff uh, and a number of the theologians of Lutheran orthodoxy. And they write almost nothing polemical um, that is not, well, Myfart, who, whom we will discuss later if we have time, he, all of his, all of his uh, polemical writings are friendly fire. He's, he's concerned about morals among the Lutherans. So both of, both of them avoid disputation with Calvinists and with, um, and with Jesuits for the most part. I think Myfart does attack the Jesuits, but certainly not among the Protestants. Um, and that sets a priority for Dilher. He doesn't want his, his students to be obsessed with disputation. Um, but he's also concerned about their moral well-being because he thinks that unless they are trained in morality, unless their morality has been well assessed before they are given a recommendation to go to the university, they will wind up with the wrong crowd, they will wind up staying out late at night, they will wind up doing the wrong things, and they will waste their time, they will waste the investment that has been made in them by their parents and by their communities. We have a little bit of time for my fart. He's the elder statesman here. He was actually an influence upon Dilher. He, he was a pastor in Erfurt. Before that, he was in... Oh, got my information wrong here. I'll just, just read it. So... As I said, his devotional works influenced Dilher, and he was likely influenced by Philip Nikolai. Most of his, most of his devotional writings have to do with end times. So he wrote a book called uh, uh, Tuba Novissima, the, the, the Last uh, Trumpet. He wrote a book about the final judgment. He wrote a book about heaven. Um, and I think that you can see this eschatological impulse is a reflection of Philip Nikolai. But unlike Nikolai, he doesn't start fights with the Calvinists constantly. Um, Nikolai says the Cal doubts whether Calvinists are Christians. It's kind of interesting. Um, in 1608, he began his studies in Jena, obtaining the Magister Artium in 1611, and continuing on to the study of theology, from 1614, he studied at Wittenberg under Leonhard Hutter. Uh, in 1616, he became adjunct to the philosophical faculty in Jena. In 1617, he became professor at the academic gymnasium in Coburg, uh, the Casimarianum, teaching especially dogmatics, church history, uh, and rhetorical exercises. So this would have been probably to 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds. In 1623, he became rector, and in 1624, he obtained the degree of Doctor of Theology. Despite the fact that Coburg um, was in the path of destruction during the, the Thirty Years' War, um, the number of students doubled during Myfart's tenure. Um, he made a lot of enemies while he was 
there because of his outspoken criticism of vices and shortcomings. Uh, He saw the prophetic task of law proclamation as an integral part of his office. Um, This brought him into conflict with colleagues who even brought legal complaints against him after he wrote a dissertation on ecclesiastical discipline. Threatened with arrest, uh, he gladly accepted a call to a Lutheran faculty in Erfurt that had been established by Gustavus Adolphus. Here, too, Meifart came into conflict with colleagues, but he also had friends and supporters, as well as the backing of the city council in reforming church discipline. Um, However, two years later, as Erfurt was annexed by Electoral Mainz, which was Roman Catholic, Meifart lost his position and became a congregational pastor in Erfurt, where he worked under harrowing conditions as the plague raged, killing 10,409 residents in Erfurt, including pastors. Because so many pastors um, died, he was given the additional task of raising up as many pastors as possible to fill their positions because he was chosen to be the head of the local ministerium. Um, he, he's known by a lot of people because he wrote a, a book criticizing witch trials. He's one of the first individuals to criticize witch trials. Except, um, I think a lot of people want to see in him perhaps uh, an, uh, an early Enlightenment thinker, but he is, he's less concerned about, he has no problem with, with uh, witch trials per se, um, but with the fact that this is done without uh, judicious and loving concern and care and attempts to convert and to call people to repentance. Um, one, of, one of his writings was a Christian reminder um, to the leaders of the various higher schools, the gymnasium in Germany. So these would have been schools for ages 12 to 18 because he had received a number of letters from former students about hazing. So there was a problem with hazing uh, at these schools. He wrote a very strongly worded warning uh, to the leaders in which he blamed the local pastors, uh, the ministerium mainly, and the teachers for the decline in morals at the, at the various schools. Um, and he, he received a lot of criticism for this, even from Gerhardt, who said that he was losing his mind. Um, it's, it's always dangerous to kind of lob grenades in your own midst. And uh, my fart did this on a few occasions. Um, I don't have notes on, on this book that he wrote um, other than to say it's very long. I didn't have time to read it all. It's about 400 pages. Um, but he begins b- by discussing his main concern, and this is probably what, uh, this is probably why he stepped on so many to- toes. He begins by saying the church is, its hel- is at its healthiest when we are all behaving like martyrs, when we are all willing to suffer for our confession of faith. And he's concerned that most of the pastors in his own day are belly fillers uh, and that they are not actually willing to suffer for the truth. And because of this, um, in fact, he even the paraphrase of what Jesus would say on the last day, condemning the, the, the lazy pastors and teachers for not uh, fulfilling their office as martyrs. So I guess you could say p- personnel is policy. That's his main concern here. He also writes a book that's used as a text um, called Rhetorica Teutsch, so German rhetoric. It's only the second of its type. It's only the second book, instructional text, on rhetoric in the vernacular. Here's probably the influence of some of the pedagogical reformers. While Meifart clearly is concerned to teach his students to be fluent in Latin, um, he's concerned that domain knowledge first be taught in the vernacular, and only after competence in Latin is acquired that it be taught in Latin. So he, he, following Rotke's lead, he does something that Rotke does not do. Rotke writes nothing, leaves nothing behind. Um, but Meifart, who was also influenced by 
Radke writes a textbook for teaching students rhetoric in the vernacular. Um, it's still no quintillion. He's not at all concerned with the disposition uh, or memorizing the text. Um, he's mainly concerned with what we would call elocution, with, um, with building up the matter with beautiful, clear, and appropriate words. So adorning your speech. And most of his, most of his instructional book is concerned with tropes and rhetorical figures and how to use them. Um, he says that he defines rhetoric as speaking ornately and convincing with art. So it's very important for him that the, the student of rhetoric, including the pastor, be able to convince. Um, and I know with our theology of the word that it is in fact the word that works faith. We're perhaps disinclined toward this, but uh, none, of, none of the theologians of Lutheran orthodoxy saw a conflict between the need to convince and to work on the affect of the hearer and the work of the word. They did not see this as manipulation. They saw this as a duty of the pastor to arouse certain feelings. It's not a, it's not a word that we're very comfortable with as Lutherans. To arouse certain feelings in the hearer. So there are three things that we're doing with rhetoric. We're proving and this is what we're driven to by necessity. We are delighting the hearer, entertaining the hearer with the loveliness of our speech. And I think we all heard that when we heard Pastor Kuntz speak today. And we are moving. And for this, we need courage. We need courage. To, that is what drives us to move. Um, and so we must speak with Tapferkeit. So our, our speech must be powerful. Um, this is a quote from a guy who's researched my fart. It's in German, Steiger. I don't think there's much research on him in English. Um, but he, he talks about how my fart explicitly mentions persuasion. And in multiple places, he says that the speech must be clear because otherwise um, the, the hearers will not let themselves be won over. In other words, what is the task of the speaker to win the hearer over? Um, he goes on to give explicit instruction on how to even use the voice and intonation in the voice and body language to arouse certain desires. And throughout his book, he follows a pattern with each trope and with each rhetorical figure. He gives a definition, and then he gives many, many examples, biblical examples. So he, he has a firm grasp on how Paul uses classical rhetoric and secular, frequently quoting Cicero. Um, and the point of this, even though he doesn't state so explicitly, although this is in other texts from the era in Latin, he's concerned with how this is learned, which is mimesis, imitation. Um, I think we could learn a bit about how we ought to teach rhetoric among, in our own midst, uh, and writing, which is the, cl the classical way of doing this is through imitation. And then he gives specific advice on how to use these tropes. Sometimes says that these should be used sparingly or only used uh, when the matter is appropriate, and he gives examples of misuse. Um, so here's an example that he gives of metonymy. Um, what, what did the holy man of God, Luther, do in his holy vocation and in his holy life? He daily prayed with Moses. He offered with Abraham. He sacrificed with Abraham. He, oh, Gewalt. We'll skip that one. Um, he preached with Samuel. He played with David. He whined with Daniel. He sighed with Jeremiah. He prophesied with Elijah. 
He wrote with the evangelists. He traveled through lands and cities with the apostles. And he suffered on account of the confession of the word of God with the martyrs. I actually added and. He actually has a syndeton here. So he's using lots of figures. His speech is always dense with figures. This is, not, this is an example that he gives in his book on rhetoric, but his sermons are full of rhetorical figures. Um, some people said too full. People cr- actually criticized him for, uh, for using, obviously using rhetorical figures too much. But it's beautiful. And you, you have this gepredigt, gespielt, gesäufset, always beginning with the past participle that begins with GE and repeating itself over and over again. So you have anaphora. And it's metonymy um, because he's doing this not with these people, obviously, but he is in a way. Luther is. And this is the power of metonymy and the power of metaphor. It's both, it's both uh, a comparison and a reality. Um, he's doing it with, with the scriptures. So this is, and there's a note that Myfart gives specifically on this instance, which he wrote himself. It's, it's his own example about how this particular use of metonymy gives us a lot to chew on, gives us a lot to think about. It makes the characters of scripture pregnant. It brings us into the comparison. And that's a brief overview of these characters. I don't have a conclusion to wrap it all up, and I think we've gone over.